Michio Kaku, The Mystery of Dark Matter With the cancellation of the SSC, some commentators have publicly speculated that physics will come to an end. Promising ideas such as the superstring theory, no matter how compelling and elegant, will never be tested, and hence can never be verified. Physicists, however, are optimists. If evidence for the superstring theory cannot be found on Earth, then one solution is to leave the Earth and go into outer space. Over the coming years, physicists will rely increasingly on cosmology to probe the inner secrets of matter and energy. Their laboratory will be the cosmos and the Big Bang itself. Already, cosmology has given us several mysteries that may very well provide clues to the ultimate nature of matter. The first is dark matter, which makes up 90% of the universe, and the second is cosmic strings. What is the world made of? One of the great achievements of the 20th century science was the determination of the chemical elements of the universe. With only a little over 100 elements, scientists could explain the trillions upon trillions of possible forms of matter, from DNA to animals to exploding stars. The familiar elements that made up the Earth, such as carbon, oxygen, and iron, were the same as the elements making up the distant galaxies. Analyzing the light taken from blazing stars billions of light years from our galaxy, scientists found precisely the same familiar elements found in our own backyard, no more, no less. Indeed, no new mysterious elements were found anywhere in the universe. The universe was made of atoms and the subatomic constituents. This, that was the final word in physics. But, by the late 20th century, an avalanche of new data has confirmed that over 90% of the universe is made of an invisible form of unknown matter, or dark matter. The stars we see in the heavens, in fact, are known, now known to make up only a tiny fraction of the real mass of the universe. Dark matter is a strange substance, unlike anything ever encountered before. It has weight but cannot be seen. In theory, if someone held a clump of dark matter in their hands, it would appear totally invisible. The existence of dark matter is not an academic question, because the ultimate fate of the universe, whether it will die in a big fiery crunch, or fade away in a cosmic whisper, or a big chill, depends on its precise nature. High mass subatomic vibrations, predicted by the superstring theory, are a leading candidate for dark matter. Thus, dark matter Thus, dark matter may give us an experimental clue to probe the nature of the superstring. Even without the SSC, science may be able to explore the new physics beyond the standard model. How much does a galaxy weigh? The scientist who first suspected that there was something wrong about our conception of the universe was Fritz Zwitsky, a Swiss-American astronomer at the California Institute of Technology. In the 1930s, he was studying the Coma Cluster of galaxies, about 300 million light years away and was puzzled by the fact that they were revolving about each other so fast that they should be unstable. To confirm his suspicions, he had to calculate the mass of a galaxy. Since galaxies can contain hundreds of billions st stars, calculating their weight is a tricky question. There are two simple ways of making this determination. The fact that these two methods gave startlingly different results had created the present crisis in cosmology. First, we can count the stars. This may seem like an impossible task, but it's really quite simple. We know the rough average density of a galaxy, and then we multiply by the total volume of the galaxy. That's how, for example, we calculate the number of hairs on the human head, and how we determine the blondes have fewer hairs than brunettes. Furthermore, we know that the average weight of the star, of course, no one actually puts a star on a scale. Astronomers instead look for binary star systems, where two stars rotate around each other. Once we know the time it takes for a complete rotation, Newton's laws are then sufficient to determine the mass of each star. By multiplying the number of stars in a galaxy by the average weight of each star, we get a rough number for the, rate of the weight of the galaxy. The second method is to apply Newton's laws directly onto the galaxy. Distant stars on a spiral arm of the galaxy, for example, orbit around the galactic center at different rates. Furthermore, galaxies and clusters of stars rotate around each other. Once we know the time it takes for these various revolutions, we can then determine the total mass of the galaxy, using Newton's laws of motion. Zwicky calculated the mass necessary to bind this cluster of galaxies by analyzing the rate at which they orbited around each other. He found that this mass was 20 times greater than the actual mass of the luminous stars. In a Swiss journal, Zwicky reported that there was a fundamental discrepancy between these two results. He postulated that there had, be, had to be some form of mysterious dungal materi, or dark matter, whose gravitational pull held the galactic cluster together. Without this dark matter, the coma galaxy should fly apart. Zwicky was led to postulate the existence of dark matter because of his unshakable belief that Newton's laws were correct out to galactic distances. This is not the first time that scientists predicted the presence of unseen objects based on faith in Newton's laws. 
The planets Neptune and Pluto, in fact, were discovered because the orbit of closer planets such as Saturn wobbled and deviated from Newton's predictions. Rather than give up on Newton's laws, scientists simply predicted the existence of new outer planets. However, Zwicky's results were met with indifference, even hostility, by the astronomical community. After all, the very existence of our galaxies beyond our own Milky Way galaxy had been determined only nine years before by Edwin Hubble. So most astronomers were convinced that his results were premature, that eventually they would fade away as better. More precise observations were made. So, Zwicky's results were largely ignored. Over the years, astronomers accidentally rediscovered them, but dismissed them as an aberration. In the 1970s, for example, astronomers used radio telescopes, analyzed the hydrogen gas surrounding a galaxy, and found that it rotated much faster than it should have, but discounted the results. In 1973, Jeremiah Ostreicher and James P. Bulls at Princeton University resurrected this theory by making rigorous theoretical calculations about the stability of a galaxy. Up to that time, most astronomers thought that a galaxy was very much like our solar system, with the inner planets traveling much faster than the outer planets. Mercury, for example, was named after the Greek god for speed, since it raced across the heavens, traveling at 170,000 miles per hour. Pluto, on the other hand, lumbers around across the solar system at 10,500 miles per hour. If Pluto traveled around the sun as fast as Mercury, then it would quickly fly into outer space, never to return. The gravitational pull of the sun would not be enough to hold on to Pluto. However, Ostriker and Peebles showed that the standard picture of a galaxy based on our solar system was unstable. By rights, the galaxy should fly apart. The gravitational pull of the stars was not enough to hold the galaxy together. They then showed that a galaxy can become stable if it is surrounded by a massive invisible halo that holds the galaxy together and if 90% of its mass was actually in the halo in the form of dark matter. Uh, their paper was also met with indifference. But after decades of skepticism and derisions, what finally turned the tide on dark matter was the careful, persistent results of astronomer Vera Rubin and her colleagues at the Carnegie Institute in Washington, D.C. The results of these scientists who analyzed hundreds of galaxies verified conclusively that the velocity in the, of the outer stars in a galaxy did not vary much from that of inner ones, const contrary to the planets in our solar system. This meant that the other outer stars should fly into space, <clears throat> causing the galaxy to disintegrate into billions of individual stars unless held together by gravitational pull by the gravitational pull of invisible dark matter like the history of dark matter itself it took several decades for vera rubin's lifetime of results to be recognized by the skeptical and overwhelmingly male astronomical community one woman's challenge it has never been easy for a female scientist to be accepted by her male peers in fact as every step of the way at every step of the way, Dr. Rubin's career came perilously close to being derailed by male hostility. She first became interested in the stars in the 1930s as a 10-year-old child, gazing at the night sky over Washington, D.C., four hours at a time, even making detailed maps of meteor trails across the heavens. Her father, an electrical engineer, encouraged her to pursue her interest in the stars, even helping her build her first telescope at the age of 14 and taking her to amateur astronomy meetings in Washington. However, the warm encouragement she felt inside her family contrasted sharply with the icy reception she received from the outside world. When she applied to Swarthmore College, the admissions officer tried to steer her away from astronomy to a more ladylike career of painting astronomical subjects. That became a standard joke around her family, she recalled. Whenever anything went wrong for me at work, someone would say, have you, thought about, uh, have you ever thought of a career in which you paint? When accepted at Vassar, she proudly told her high school physics teacher in the hallway, who replied bluntly, You'll do all right as long as you stay away from science. Years later, she recalled, It takes an enormous amount of self-esteem to listen to things like that and not be demolished. After graduating from Vassar, she applied to graduate school at Princeton, which had a world-renowned reputation in astronomy. However, she never even received the school's catalog, since Princeton did not accept female graduate students in astronomy until 1971. She was accepted at Harvard, but declined to off the offer because she had just gotten married to Robert Rubin, a phys physical chemist that followed him to Cornell University, where the astronomy department consisted of just two faculty members. After she declined, she got a formal letter back from Harvard with the handwritten words scrawled on the bottom. Damn you woman, every time I get a good one ready, she goes off and gets married. Going to Cornell, however, was a blessing in disguise, since Rubin took graduate courses in physics from two Nobel laureates in physics, Hans Beth, who decorated, decoded the complex fusion reactions which energized the stars, and Richard Feynman, who re renormalized quantum electrodynamics. 
Her master's thesis met head on the hostility of male-dominated world. Her paper, which showed that the fairway, faraway galaxies deviated from the uniform expansion of a simplified version of the Big Bang model, was rejected for publication because it was far too far, or it was too far fetched for its time. Decades later, her paper would be considered prophetic. But after receiving her master's degree from Cornell, Rubin found herself an unhappy housewife. I actually cried every time the astrophysical journal came into the house. Nothing in my education had taught me that one year after Cornell, my husband would be out doing his science and I'd be home changing diapers. Nonetheless, Rubin struggled to pursue her childhood dream, especially after her husband took a job in Washington. Taking nighttime classes, she received her PhD from Georgetown University. In 1954, she published her PhD thesis, a landmark study that showed that the distribution of the galaxies in the heavens was not smooth and uniform, as previously thought, but actually clumpy. Unfortunately, she was years ahead of her time. Over the years, she gained a reputation of being something of an eccentric, going against the prevailing prejudice of astronomical thought. It would take years for her ideas to gain the recognition they deserved. Distressed by the controversy her work was generating, Rubin decided to take a respite and study one of the most mundane and unglamorous areas of astronomy, the rotation of the galaxies. Innocently enough, Rubin began studying the Andromeda galaxy, our nearest neighbor in space. She and her colleagues expected to find that the gas swirling in the outer fringes of the Andromeda galaxy were traveling much slower than the gas near the center. Like our own solar system, the speed of the gas should slow down as one went farther from the galactic nuclei. Much to their surprise, they found that the velocity of the gas was a constant, whether it was near the center or near the rim of the galaxy. At first, they thought that this peculiar result was unique to the Andromeda galaxy. Then they systematically began to analyze hundreds of galaxies, 200 galaxies since 1978, and found the same curious result. Zwicky had been right all along. The sheer weight of the observational results could not be denied. Galaxy after galaxy showed the same flat curve. Because astronomy had become technically much more sophisticated since the time of Zwicky, it was possible for other laboratories to verify Rubin's numbers rapidly. The constancy of velocity of a rotating galaxy was now a universal fact of galactic physics. Dark matter was here to stay. For her pioneering efforts, Vera Rubin was elected to the prestigious National Academy of Science in 1981. Since it was founded in, 19, er, in 1863, only 75 women among the 3,508 scientists have been elected to the Academy. Today, Rubin is still pained by how little progress female scientists have made. Her own daughter has a PhD in cosmic ray physics. When she went to Japan for an international conference, she was the only woman there. I really couldn't tell that story for a long time without weeping, Rubin recalled, because certainly in one generation, between her generation and mine, not an awful lot has changed. Not surprisingly, Rubin is interested in stimulating the interest of young girls to pursue scientific studies. She has even written a child children's book entitled, My Grandmother is an Astronomer. Bending Starlight Since Rubin's original paper, even more sophisticated analysis of the universe have shown the existence of the dark matter halo, which may be as much as six times the size of the galaxy itself. In 1986, Bowden Pizinski of Princeton University realized that if the starlight from a distant star traveled by a nearby clump of dark matter, the dark matter might bend the starlight and act as a magnifying lens, making the star appear much brighter. In this way, by looking for dim stars that suddenly got brighter, the presence of dark matter could be detected. In 1994, two groups independently reported photographing, photographing such as stellar brightening. Since then, other teams of astronomers have joined in, hoping to find more examples of stellar brightening. In addition, the bending of starlight by a distant galaxy can be used as another way in which to calculate the galaxy's weight. Anthony Tyson and his colleagues at the AT&T Bell Laboratories have analyzed light rays from dim blue galaxies at the rim of the visible universe. This cluster of galaxies act like a gravitational lens, bending the light from other galaxies. Photos of distant galaxies have confirmed that the bending is much more than expected, meaning that their weight comes from much more than the sum of their individual stars. 90% of the mass of these galaxies turns out to be dark, as predicted. Hot and cold dark matter While the existence of dark matter is no longer in dispute, its composition is a matter of lively controversy. Several schools of thought have emerged, none of them very satisfactory. First, there is the hot dark matter school, which holds that dark matter is made of familiar lightweight subparticles such as neutrinos, which are notoriously difficult to detect. Since the total flux of neutrinos filling up the universe is not well known, the universe may be bathed in a flood of neutrinos making up the dark matter of the universe. If the electron neutrino, for example, is found to have a tiny mass, then there is a chance that it may have enough mass to make up the missing mass problem. 
In February 1995, physicists at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico announced that they have found evidence that the electron neutrino has a tiny mass, one millionth the weight of an electron. However, this result must still be verified by other laboratories before it is finally accepted by other physicists. Then, there is the cold dark matter school, which suspects that dark matter is made of heavier, slow-moving, and much more exotic subparticles. For the past decade, physicists have been looking for exotic candidates that might make up cold dark matter. These per particles have been given strange, whimsical names, such as axions, named after a household detergent. Collectively, they are called WIMPs, for weakly interacting massive par particles. The skeptics have retaliated by pointing out that the significant part of dark matter may consist of familiar but dim forms of ordinary matter, such as red dwarf stars, neutron stars, black holes, and Jupiter-sized planets. Not to be outdone, they have called their objects machos, machos for massive astrophysical compact halo objects. However, e however, even the proponents of Mako admit that, at best, they can explain only 20% of the dark matter problem. In late 1994, however, a version of the Mako theory was dealt a blow when the Hubble Space Telescope scanning the Milky Way galaxy for red dwarf stars found far fewer of, those, of these dim stars than expected. But perhaps the most promising candidate for WIMPs are the superparticles, or sparticles for short. Supersymmetry, we remember, was first seen as a symmetry of particle physics in the superstring theory. Indeed, the superstring is probably the only fully consistent theory of superparticles. According to the supersymmetry, every particle must have a superpartner with a differing spin. The leptons, electrons and neutrinos, for example, have a spin one half. Their superpartners are called sleptons and have a spin zero. Likewise, the superpartners of the quarks are called squarks and also have spin zero. Furthermore, the superpartner of the spin one photon, which describes light, is called the photino. And the superpartner of the gluons, which hold the quarks together, is called gluino. The main criticism of sparticles is that we have never seen them before in the laboratory. At present, there is no evidence that these superparticles exist. However, it is widely believed that the lack of evidence is only because our atom smashers are too feeble to create superparticles. In other words, their mass is simply too large for our atom smashers to produce them. Lack of concrete evidence has not, however, prevented physicists from trying to use particle physics to explain the mysteries of dark matter and cosmology. For example, one of the leading candidates for the WIMP is the Photino. The cancellation of the SSC, therefore, does not necessarily doom our attempt to verify the correctness of the superstring. Within the next decade, it is hoped that the increased accuracy of our astronomical observations with the development of a new generation of telescopes and satellites may narrow down the candidates for dark matter. If dark matter turns out to be compressed, composed, at least in part, of particles, belief in the superstring theory would receive an enormous boost. How will the universe die? Last, dark matter may prove decisive in understanding the ultimate fate of the universe. One persistent controversy has been the fate of an expanding universe. Some believe that there is a, enough matter and gravity to reverse its expansion. Others believe that the universe is too low in density, so that the galaxies will continue their expansion until temperature around the universe approaches absolute zero. At present, attempts to calculate the average density of the universe show the later to be true. The universe will die in cosmic whimper, or a big chill, expanding forever. However, this theory is open to experimental challenges. Specifically, there might be enough missing matter to boost the average density of the universe. To determine the fate of the universe, cosmologists use a particle called a mega, uh, which measures the matter density of the universe. If a mega is greater than one, then there is enough matter in the universe to reverse the cosmic expansions, and the universe will begin to collapse until it reaches a big crunch. However, if a mega is less than one, and the gravity in the universe is too weak to change the cosmic expansions, and the universe will expand forever until it reaches the near absolute zero temperatures of the cosmic whimper. If a mega is equal to one, then the universe is balanced between these two scenarios, and the universe will appear to be perfectly flat without any curvature. For a mega to equal one, the density of the universe must be approximately three hydrogen atoms per cubic meter. Current astronomical data favor a value of 0.1 for a mega, which is too small to reverse the cosmic expansion. The leading modification of the Big Bang Theory is the, infla is the inflationary universe, which predicts a value of a mega of precisely 1. However, the visible stars in the heaven only give us 1% of the critical density. This is something called the missing mass problem. It is different from the dark matter problem, which has been based on purely galactic considerations. Dust, brown dwarfs, non-luminous stars may boost this number a bit, but not by much. 
For example, the results from nucleosynthesis show that the maximum value of the density of this form of non-luminous matter cannot exceed 15% of the critical density. Even if we add in the dark matter halos that surround the galaxy, this only brings us up to 10% of the critical value. So the dark matter and halos cannot solve the missing mass problem by itself.